Hello everyone and welcome to an introduction to Quixel Mixer. My name is Tyler Purrier and I'm going to be sure to do my best to take you guys step by step through how the software works and how to use it so that you can get started creating your own mixes. Now if you don't already know what Mixer is, that's okay. It is a user friendly layer based texture creation and texture mixing software. It allows you to create textures from scratch, paint masks, utilize Megascan's uh, integration, make them completely procedural and have all sorts of abilities to mix them all around in a non-destructive way to use seamlessly in your projects. It is truly a wonderful asset to have and I'm going to take you through the software so that you can get started on your own mixes. So if you go to quicksilver.com and hit the uh, mixer tab, it'll bring you to this page. And if you haven't already done so, just click download mixer and go through the installation process. And once you've gone through the installation process and you've finally opened up Quixel Mixer, this is the first uh, uh, screen that you'll see and it'll basically show you all your projects so you can create as many project folders as you want and then put um, any amount of mixes within those projects. Here we have some sample mixes that come with the software, but let's go ahead and just go up here and add new mix. You can name your mix whatever you want. You can also select the working resolution and you can select the PBR workflow. You have the obvious specular workflow or the metallic roughness workflow, which is what I'm going to be using by default. We're not gonna create one just yet. I'm just gonna go ahead and select one of these sample mixes that come with the software that you could uh, open up as well. So let's choose wet mud and click open. So here we have mixer open and in my opinion, it's a pretty clean UI. We have our viewport here of what you're working on. You have the layer stack and we have the property stack here, which we'll cover in a second, but let's run through some of the top toolbars here. Under file, we have some of your basic things like save as, open and export. This export to library option here is if you finish your texture and you export to your library, what's that gonna do is export to your local library. So it's gonna have all of your mega scans or your uh, textures that you've created in Mixer all together in one location. Then moving over to edit, let's open up preferences. And once you installed the software, it should have asked you where you want your project files to be located or your standard mixes to be located. But if you didn't, or if you want to go ahead and change it, this is the location to do that. So your mixer files, it'll ask you where you want those to be uh, located or where's your library that you have uh, positioned on your hard drive, your Megascans library. And if we look at that local library, let's go ahead and just hit cancel real quick. Let's go to local library in this tab next to viewport. These, this will categorize and show you all the textures that you have in your local library, which was specified under that preference location, local library. So again, back to file, if you export, if we were to export this wet mud texture, it would appear here in our local library. And back in settings, if we make sure we have our viewport selected, we have a couple options that we can see here. We can do viewport down sampling, which helps some performance. We can change our grid color. We could change our grid cell size and keep in mind that these cell sizes are based on meters. So let's do a two by two. Actually, let's keep it at one by one with this default. So one meter by one meter grid size, and it'll have a, a, a sub grid below that. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. If we were to click show grid, it would show our grid and each one of these primary lines here is one meter by one meter. And then it segregates that into uh, sections of 10 centimeters. And if you zoom pretty far in, you can get each individual centimeter. Now, if we have the library tab selected, we could do a few other things to add textures to our library. We could import assets from a folder. So if you have uh, a, a slew of your mixes in a different folder, you can go ahead and just import those all together or you can import Megascans zips. Sometimes, or most of the times, when you download a Megascan from online, it comes in a zip file. You don't even have to worry about unzipping that. You could just import directly and it'll go ahead and unzip it for you. And it'll also automatically um, place that Megascan in the correct subfolder and categorization in your Megascans, in your local Megascans library. You can import a custom surface, which we can go through later. You can download all acquired assets. And I don't really recommend this unless you want to wait for a very long time. But this is basically going to take every single um, mega scan asset that you have online and download it to your library. So depending on what you have, that could take some time as well as this refresh library option. So let's go ahead and just uh, go over to our local library tab. 
And if we've, say for example, we've added a texture or five textures here and they don't really show up for some reason, you just go to library, hit refresh library. It'll scan all of the assets that you have in your local library and it'll refresh the entire stack. As well as, this is another really cool feature, built into Quicksum Mixer, you can go ahead and select this online tab and then make sure you're signed in with your email here to whatever your um, Quixel account is and look here, every single Megascan asset is categorized for you, already layered here, just like it would be on, in online. So it's pretty quick and easy. So if you just wanted to say, select one of this uh, new texture, just like online, download settings, download it, and then it will automatically download to your local library and categorize it for you already. Pretty handy. Now let's move on to some of our viewport options here. Up here is this tab that says PBR. And what's that doing is it's showing, it's displaying all of your PBR textures in the viewport. So if we select this, we can drop down and if we want to see just the finished exported uh, albedo, we can click that and see that map just like we can go to each and every map and see what the finished output would be before we actually export it. In addition, each one of these texture views is associated to the number, number row on your keyboard. So if you press two on the keyboard, it goes to the albedo. Three is go to the metalness, gloss, roughness is five, six is normal, seven is displacement, so on and so forth. And then if you press number one on the keyboard, it goes back to the PBR. Once you use this, um, the number pad or the number row on your keyboard quite frequently, you'll get used to exactly which uh, textures are displaying pretty quickly. Next, we have the preview displacement option. And what this is doing, it's going to make sure that there is tessellation on our terrain. We can't see this in this top down view yet, but if we click this uh, little 3D box here, it says perspective camera. So let's zoom in with our mouse wheel here. And if we turn off preview displacement, we can see that the tessellation in the texture has basically flattened. So the only thing that's providing our shadows or fake shadows is the normal map. The next icon we have is the preview tiling. Now, if you press this, it's going to obviously, let's zoom back out. It's going to tile your texture into a three by three grid. Now this doesn't actually make the physical size of our terrain any bigger. It's just giving you a preview, a quick preview, so to speak, of what it would look like tiled a little bit. And as before, we have the perspective camera, which turns the flat view and perspective view. Also, we have this uh, drop down menu here that changes our lighting scheme, or so I say the HDR map that is displayed around our texture. So it changes the lighting, as you can see on the terrain, pretty drastically. And just like some other 3D applications, if you hold down shift and hold down your right mouse button and move it around, you can change the lighting direction or basically what you're doing is you're changing the rotation of the HDR map. You can kind of see the uh, Pisa HDR map we can see here in the reflections. Another thing I would like to add is if this tessellation, if you still want it, but the tessellation is doing a little bit too heavy performance on your system, if we go to display here in this display tab, we can change the tessellation value. So if we drop it down to one, we can probably way more easily move around in the scene, which all this does, let's just adds a higher uh, resolution to the tessellation. So let's zooming in, we have a tessellation of one and let's uh, go max out to the 10. You can see it adds just a little subtle effect here, but not too much. I would probably just leave it at somewhere between one and five while you're working just for performance sake, because it's not gonna make a huge, Difference. It's more of a visual aid while you're working and it could help, you know, this is really smooth as you can see in my viewport. But if I change it up to 10 and do the same thing, it is very choppy. But if you have the system to do that, then go right ahead. I'm going to just drop it back to one for the sake of your eyes in this tutorial. While we're already in the display menu, let's go ahead and just go through some of these settings real quick. We have the background. So the background is showing the color that's in the background. I have it on flat, but that's not the default. The default is actually gradient. So the bottom is gray and the light is light. I like it on flat, which is a nice mute. It's kind of like a almost a 20% uh, gray or 80% gray, depending on how you're looking at it. I like the background to be a solid gray so that it's easy for my eyes to represent the color more accurately. 
Also, you can change this to skybox, which allows you to see the HDR map behind. So if we zoom our texture out here, and then as again, alt left click, we can see our HDR map with what we're doing. And if we shift and right click and move around, you can see that it is moving our HDR skybox. We can also change the light intensity and light rotation, which I've, the light rotation is basically what you just did with the uh, left shift and right mouse button. The light intensity is how, how strong the HDR map is being brightened. So sometimes it could be a little bit hefty or a little bit light. So I like to just keep it on the default of one and let the HDR map really push its thing. Unless it's more of a darker scene like the overcast um, option here. If we select overcast, it's a little dark. And if we want that to really punch up a little bit, we can show maybe it's not so overcast. So that's another option to uh, pay attention to. And your field of view, as you'd expect, changes your, your field of view. I'm just going to go ahead and leave it at the default for the sake of this tutorial. And then we have a draw back faces, which is basically just showing you that it's going to visually display the underface of the surface here. Or if you want to activate anti-aliasing, which I'm just going to go ahead and do it by default so that all of our um, tessellation and um, textures here are rather smooth. And if we move over here to the settings tab, this is basically just the same settings that you established whenever you created the new mix like before. So the working resolution and the PBR workflow that you're wanting to do. So there's nothing too big to that. But keep in mind that the working resolution is not the final export resolution. You could work at 256 by 256 resolution on your terrain and export at 8K. It, it's perfectly scalable in this program and it's really handy. So if you have a taxing, if the um, program is being taxing on your system, just go ahead and work it as something a little bit lower, like 1K or 2K. And then when you think you're finished, go ahead and just bump it up to 4K or 8K just to kind of visually see what you're looking at maybe. And then you can export from there. It's perfectly seamless. And let's go ahead and move over to the performance tab. And I don't have to go through these too much because there's a description exactly on what they are, but there are some um, performance enhancements that can help you work around your, your projects easier. For instance, the default frame rate, I, I, I think is 60 FPS, but I don't, I personally don't need the 60 FPS because I'm going to be working rather slowly. I'm not shooting on the terrain like you would in a uh, FPS game. So I'm just going to select it at 30 FPS so that my performance is a little easier. You can lower the viewport resolution. So while you're like tweaking something, you can see when I zoomed in, the resolution of the terrain kind of lowered a little bit. And if I scroll out, you can see it does the same thing and it reinitiates. So that's what this uh, camera movement option here is. So all these settings will do their task that they're saying to do while you're moving the camera. So disable back faces is what I like to do. So if we want to disable back faces while the camera is moving, you see it makes the back face go invisible. And then once I release the mouse trigger, it reinitiates the back face. I like to keep the tessellation where it's at, especially if my tessellation is at one, it doesn't really matter because I don't want the bumps to change. But if you're going to say have a tessellation of five or more, I would consider turning lower tessellation on because that's basically going to temporarily lower the tessellation to say level one. And that makes your panning and zooming a little bit more user friendly. And here's our export tab and I'll cover here just after the layers tab. So I want to go ahead and just sh quickly show you the layers tab. So this is our layer stack and it's treated very similarly to like Photoshop. We could add a new surface. And if we add a new surface, that's basically saying, these things are obviously surfaces or in our local library, these are surfaces. So when you add a surface, it's wanting to basically add a mix or a mega scan scan to your layer stack. Same thing with the add decal or Atlas layer. If we click that, it's going to take us to all the decal layers that you have in your local library, at least. And you can add this as a stamp, so to speak, onto your terrain. The solid layer basically just adds a solid surface and we can hide or unhide the solid layer. We can go over here to our properties panel and we can change the albedo color if we want to that, uh, that solid layer. And a little bit, let's try a little hot orange here. Ooh, no, wait, never mind. That's green. And then we can also change the color of the metalness and the glossiness. So solid layer is a good base to start with, and we'll cover that in some later episodes on all the things you could do with the solid layer. 
Then we can add a liquid layer, which is basically adding the water petals that you see here in the image. This layer here, water petals at the, at the top, is essentially added by this liquid layer. And there's all these settings to adjust the depth of the water, the reflections of the water, the colors of the water, how it picks up the texture below. And we'll dedicate a special video just to the um, water layer feature. And then we have the add noise layer, which is basically the exact same thing as this layer. We could add a noise layer and then we could change the all the settings required to add different uh, procedural effects to our, our um, texture. And the last icon up here is the add paint layer. Now this is pretty handy. So if we go ahead and click it, but then a new panel comes up, this paint panel. So we're going to dedicate a video all to painting and sculpting. But here are some settings to you can play with to basically paint or erase from your terrain. And this you can do anything from painting height maps to painting textures to creating um, masks if you want. There is a lot of versatile options that you can do with the and one handy feature of this paint layer is you can specify its own resolution. So if you want the a more faded type look, you can specify a low resolution or if you need some really fine tuned details around these rocks and cracks or something that you just can't get with a lower resolution, bump that resolution up, paint it with a small paintbrush size and it'll be crisp and clear. And a couple icons down here at the bottom, which are pretty handy. We could delete the layer or mask, obviously, but we have our masking options here. So if we go ahead and select the gravel layer, for example, and we hit the add mask stack or we hit the paint a mask layer, which is exactly what I was saying that you can paint a mask if you want. So if we go ahead and hit add a mask stack and we have the mask selected here on the right, as indicated by the blue outline, if we select the um, color icon here on the left, the entire layer is selected. So the layer is going to give all the layer options. But if we select the uh, mask again, it'll highlight just the mask. And this will bring up all the options that we want to do for the mask. So say we want to just add a mask or add a mask modifier. Let's go ahead and add a mask component. Just add some, some Perlin noise here. So we add some Perlin noise. And I don't know if you saw the effect that happened just ever so slightly, but we can go ahead and just toggle the view here and look in our viewport here real quick. If I toggle this again, we can see our gravel is being distributed based on this mask. One thing that we can do, which is pretty handy, is if we have the mask selected and we hit nine, which is the mat layer mask option under our texture view uh, panel here, we can see exactly what this noise looks like to our texture. Same thing happens if we select a different layer. So let's select this moisture layer. Now our moisture layer is only going to be showing up based on this layer mask or the water puddles is a little bit brighter of the same thing. So it shows up there. So seeing the um, mask here directly on our, our texture plane here is a pretty handy feature to that way you can easily see what you're adjusting while you're adjusting all your settings. And by default at the very bottom of the layer stack is this plane layer. Now you don't have any control about where that is positioned in the layer stack, but this is pretty crucial. This says it's a plane of two by two meters and we could change our terrain size from one by one meter or hundred meter by hundred meter. This isn't going to change the working resolution. So no matter what physical size texture plane you want to have, it's going to be a still the same working resolution as well as your export options can still be whatever size as well. It, this is basically controlling all of the physical size of all of the surfaces all of the um, wet layers, the paint layers, the masks, the noises. And so let's go ahead and just click one by one meter here. And you can see it's loading texture. So it's got to redistribute the textures. I don't know if you noticed here, the noise uh, got a little bit smaller, more fine grained noise. Now keep in mind that the scaling of all the surfaces, the noises and the um, masks uh, will definitely scale. But the one thing that doesn't scale are patterns. And we'll get to that in another video. We're going to really go over some of the pattern effects. But keep in mind that when you do a, a distributed pattern across this uh, texture plane, no matter what physical size you have, even if it's all the way up at 100 by 100 meters, which is pretty large, by the way, um, it will not change its pattern. So you'll have to keep that in mind to rechange the pattern um, tiling. And lastly, whenever you have your texture plane the exact way that you want, you can go ahead and go to the export tab. You can name the export surface 
and choose its location. You can also create a subfolder and add a resolution to the file name, which I personally like to do because I like to do multiple export resolutions. I like to export at 2K, 4K, and 8K, as those could be used for LODs or for different style projects um, on whatever you're working for. So setting those up whenever you add the resolution to the file names, it's just a little bit easier to manage. You can also choose the export format of different variations that you're used to. And down here we have all the maps that it's going to export at the time. So we can uncheck and check these depending on how, if we are wanting some to be um, exported or not. We can rename them to be whatever we want. Click this little uh, arrow button down here and it'll do a drop down. And this will be described uh, some settings that you can choose between how you want the um, RGB. Do you want it to be 8-bit or 16-bit, which would be under displacement here. 16 bit. If you choose under displacement to be EXR, you can go all the way up to 32 bit, which is pretty nice. And you can also add a map. So you can name it, you can add it. So you want to, when you decide what RGB values it is, you can select this and it's going to say, all right, do we want it to be the albedo color? Do we want it to be the normal, the roughness, the glossiness? What is it? It needs something to know what this texture um, is being based off of. So this pretty much covers the general overview of Quixel Mixer's UI. I will be covering more in-depth guides to materials in the videos that follow. I will do my best to take you step-by-step -step on how to create pattern textures, how to import height maps, how to texture terrains. We'll do so much more in the videos later on. Thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next one.